figured it out. I figured it out from black and white. What I'd like to do today is I'll just say a little bit, very little bit, about myself, my life, what I do. Then I would like to tell a couple stories about this thing called attachment and attachment theory. Then I'd like to try to explain a little bit about what it is. And from there, you know, I think if you have questions or thoughts or ideas that come from anything that I say, uh, it would be nice to have a little conversation. So we'll try and squeeze that all into about 35 minutes. Okay, so as Father Anthony so graciously uh, introduced me, I'll say a little about m my personal life. My wife and I, and our four daughters all attend St. Gregory the Theologian down in Mansfield. My wife is a, a pediatric nurse who works at the Jimmy Fund and uh, we have two older girls in their 20s and then we took 10 years off to recover from those two and had two more daughters after that. Originally I'm from Indiana but uh, I was saying to Christina um, but we've lived here in Massachusetts now for almost 30 years. So this is home now. We wouldn't want to be anywhere else. The thing that I'm most proud of in my uh, educational background is that in 1988, I was the seminarian assigned to St. Basilios for my field work. And uh, I worked under Mary Frangos. All right. So let me first tell you a little story about St. Vasilios. Uh, when we first moved here to, so that I could go to the seminary, uh, there was a recent graduate of the school who at the time, his name was Chris Festukas. <laughs> you might know him. And his ordination was going to take place, some of you may have even been there, uh, at St. Vasilios. And at the time, the iconography was not what it is now. It was getting older and some of it needed to be replaced. And so my wife and I were sitting in a pew and there were a couple of um, women in front of us and Father Chris's family and, and everybody was there for the, uh, the ordination. And it came to the part where the bishop was about to lay his hands on Father Chris in order to bless him and uh, ordain him. So the hands were a very important part of this part of the ceremony. Well, the icon at the top of the church in the dome, the, the Pandocrator, was starting to break down a little bit. And a piece of it was starting to tear off the dome, but it was too high to repair and and so it came time for uh, then Bishop Methodius to lay his hands on Father Chris when all of a sudden there was movement in, in the dome. Now there's angels up there and there's spiritual beings and, and there's the icon of God the Almighty. So to have movement going on up there was a little concerning to everybody. And all of a sudden there was this swooshing sound and a piece of the icon, about this big, landed in the pew in front of us. The woman sitting in the pew, without missing a beat, she was not flustered at all, bent over, picked it up. It was the hand of the Pandocrator. She kissed it and then put it back down and the ordination continued. <laughs> So, I always tell Father Chris that the hand of God literally came down at his ordination. You can ask him about that story. It's true. So our ties to St. Vasilios go way back and it, that, that's part of what makes it special to be here now. So I want to talk a little bit about attachment theory, which is, you know, in the course of being a psychologist, some of the things that it's been a privilege actually to experience is that there are ways of thinking about the human person and about human relationships that are so closely connected to orthodox theology that you can see the way God works in a world across 
disciplines across faiths, God's, God the Trinity's place in our world can be found anywhere we look if we look closely enough. So as a psychologist, one of the places that I ended up finding something really valuable in this way was in this thing called attachment theory. The connection that I found from a theological perspective is that the ancient Orthodox tradition is that God is both one and what? Three. And in order to be three, God has to exist as three persons. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, there's one God, but God himself exists as three persons in loving relationship. The, the source of all life, the source of all that is, exists. This is an important point. The source of all that is exists as a relating, loving God. And so the Father, and, and you see this in, in the Gospel accounts, the way Jesus talks about the Father with such love, the way he talks about the Comforter or the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, the way at Theophany recently, the Holy Spirit came down to acknowledge Jesus being baptized in the Jordan. There's this love that passes amongst the persons of the Trinity, and that's just, that's the very core of being. So, as human beings, created in the image and likeness of a God that is, at his core, relational, what do you think that means for us? I think it means that we cannot, we can't even exist unless we are relating, unless we are in loving relationships ourselves. We're made to love. There are all kinds of messages we can find in all kinds of places about what we're made for. And they don't always say that we're made to love. They might say that we're made to dress well, or we're made to eat a lot, or we're made to make a lot of money, or we're made to become powerful, or we're made to be taken advantage of. There are a lot of those messages out there, but the thing that I'm going to try and uh, connect to attachment theory is the, the most fundamental point of our theology. We're made to love and be loved. Cut, print, that, it, that's where it starts. Anything that happens beyond that is because of loving and being loved. And that's because our Creator is a God who is constantly <coughs> living out love, loving and being loved. So, not, not even all psychology would say that we were made to be loved. But attachment theory, I think, gets as close to it as anything that I've come across in psychology. So what is attachment theory? Just a couple basic ideas. The first one is that from an attachment perspective, and it's, this, is about, this is talking about human attachment, Human beings require two things in order to thrive. One is relational security. To know we belong to someone, to know someone belongs to us, it's, it's connection. That's the first thing. Interestingly, that's not the whole story from an attachment theory perspective, and I would submit probably from an Orthodox Christian perspective. The second thing that human beings are made for is for exploration or learning. So love and exploration is what attachment theory would suggest we're made for. Keep that in mind as, as we go on. So how did, how did this theory come to be? A guy named John Bowlby who was a uh, psychologist and psychological theorist back in the 1950s and 1960s was being trained in a super shrinky Sigmund Freud kind of way. Like, you know, uh, aggression and 
uh, you know, drives are what make a human human. And he's like, I, he worked with a lot of kids and families. He goes, I don't think that's how it, I don't think that's what it is. But what Bowlby began to notice was that the relationships that children had with their parents typically had an influence on the level of exploration that those children would do. So he sent out an ad. This was uh, in England. He sent out an ad. He said, I need a, a research assistant to help me think about this theory. And a woman named Mary Main answered the ad. And so John Bowlby and Mary Main came up with this experiment called the Strange Situations Test to test out this idea about children and exploration. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the uh, experiment. Then I'm going to tell you another story. So here's how the experiment worked. They went out and got hundreds and hundreds of one and a half to two year old kids. And they brought them in along with one of their primary caregiver and they created this room that was as fun as possible for a one and a half to two year old. Full of toys and colors and windows and books and balls to play with. It was, it was like the ultimate playroom. And then they would send in each child with their caregiver. And the first part of the experiment was just to see how the child did when they walked into this room. The second part of the experiment was to have a stranger walk into the room with the caretaker still there. Back when they did this, it was almost all mothers with the kids, but not that that's the only primary caretaker people have, but in this case it was. The third part of the experiment was to have the parent leave and the fourth part of the, and leave the kid there with the stranger, the fourth part of the experiment was to have the parent return. So, what they ended up finding was there were four particular things that happened with the children. Basically, they fell into one of four groups. The first group they called the securely attached kids. And here's how it went with them. Those kids came in with their parent. It didn't take long before they were like, wow, what a great room. And they were off exploring, playing, throwing balls, opening books, showing things to their parent. The stranger would come in and the secure kids would kind of look at the stranger, would move a little closer to their caretaker, watch their caretaker and see how they felt about the stranger, and then very quickly would go back to playing. Then, the parent would leave, and the securely attached kids would look, get upset, some of them would cry, they would not accept comfort from the stranger, and they'd be looking around for the parent, and then the parent would return, and what do you think, what do you think the child would do? They'd well, actually, everything that you just said. They'd go like this. <laughs> and then go back to playing. So that's, that's secure. That's, those are the securely attached kids. The second group of kids was what they called preoccupied, angry attachment. Preoccupied, angry attachment. Those kids would walk in with their parent and they would stand very, very close for a while. Maybe after a little bit of time, they'd start looking around, but they kept in close proximity to the parent. Then the stranger would come in, and those children would quickly, holding on, and would avoid the stranger and would not go back to playing. Then, when the stranger or when the parent left the room, 
those kids would, ha would fall on the floor and cry and scream. And then when the parent returned, what do you think that, that child did? Ran back to the parent, but would hit the parent and pull at the parent and be angry with the parent because for leaving, right. Okay, so those are the preoccupied angry kids. Third group, preoccupied passive. These kids would come in, again, like glue. Wouldn't, wouldn't do much exploration. Stranger would come in, glue. No exploration. Parent would leave, and they would just sit on the floor. It would be like they didn't have the energy even to protest the parent leaving. And when the parent came back, what would be your prediction for these kids? Indifferent. Indifferent. They, 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 would just, they would just sit quietly, sadly. The parent would pick them up, but they wouldn't, they didn't have that passionate reconnection and exploration. So different ways of responding in the preoccupied kids, but the main thing was they were so preoccupied with the presence or absence of their caretaker that they really didn't get around to exploring that really cool room. The fourth group is what they call the avoidant kids. The avoidant kids would walk in with the parent and immediately would start exploring the room. Start picking up things, walking around. Stranger walks in, the kids would be indifferent. They say, oh, keep looking around, exploring. The parent would leave, no reaction. They would just keep doing what they were doing. The parent would return, what would you guess? Same thing. They just, and at first, Bowlby and Maine said, wow, there's your, there's your healthy kids. Look, they don't even, it doesn't even matter if the parent's there or not. But what they learned as their technique of investigation started to include things like vital signs and skin response and respiration and later on even levels of cortisol is those avoidant kids stress hormones and stress levels were through the roof even though it looked like they were calm and exploring so what what's come to to be understood is that the secure kit to be securely attached does not mean you don't you're not affected by ruptures and repairs it means you're you're attached and you go get relational security so that you can do what? Explore, learn, live. But the preoccupied kids would feel but not deal. And the avoidant kids would deal but not feel, at least not show the feel. Okay, so that, those are the parameters of what attachment theory has put out there. Now there's been these, these experiments have been replicated in cultures all over the world. And what Bowlby would say is that these are biologically based behavioral systems that assure the connection and reconnection of vulnerable little humans to their safety net caretakers. It's built into being human. And I, I actually like the language of it being evolutionary because what that suggests to me is that it's built into the very fibers of being human. That God really did make us human beings so that we had, we had to have love and we had to be loved. It's in the very core of who we are. So, if there's... I'm going to try and give you a couple takeaways before we end. One takeaway is... The role that you can play in creating relational security for anybody is God's work. 
and it's not, it's not, it may be most evident between a young child who's helpless and their caretaker, but it's something we need throughout the lifespan. So the degree to which, or the ways in which any one of us creates relational security for another person is God's work. And the fruit of it is that that other person becomes free to explore. It's not that they become so dependent on us, we, we can't get them away from us. The goal of relational security is so that the other person can become more fully human, can come fully alive in the way that God wants that person to become alive. So the offering of love is in our hands. The results of that love, as those of us who are parents of developing children know, it isn't so much in our hands. The more we try and control it, as a matter of fact, the more it tends to get funky. We love them so that they can explore in the way that they need to explore, so they can become who they are. That's takeaway take number one. If, as a matter of fact, if we had to stop now, it's all good. That's number one takeaway. Quick story. So this comes from the ancient historian Eusebius. And he, was, uh, he wrote about St. John the Theologian, who after his exile to Patmos, the Greek island Patmos, where he wrote the Revelation, he was also one of the, the writers of uh, a gospel account, the gospel according to John. John came back from Patmos and traveled for many years starting churches throughout Asia. And so... On one of his stops, he met this young boy, a late, late teenager, probably 16, 17 years old. This boy was an orphan, had had a very hard life, had lost his parents. But for some reason, something clicked with John. John got this kid. This kid felt loved by John, and John stayed there for months and months and months working with the people to, to start the church there, but he especially worked with this kid to try and teach him the faith, to baptize him, to, to ground him, to offer him relational security so that he could begin to explore a life that he wasn't going to have before he met John. And it was a good relationship. My guess is I, I could probably ask each of you, in your lifetime, have you come across somebody that you just knew got you, understood you, saw you, helped you feel more alive, more whole, more ready to take on the world? Most of us have had at least a taste of that. Some, some of us might say we've had more than that. And, and each of us has our own story. For this boy, it was John, St. John. So the time came, St. John said, well, my job is to go out and, and go to some more communities. He went to the person that he, he named presbyter of that community. Actually, it was probably the bishop of the community. And he said, I have to go. And this boy's not ready to leave here yet. I'm putting it on you to take care of him and make sure he stays close to the community and he continues to grow in the faith. And the bishop said, yes, I'll do that. I'll take care of it. And John went on his way. It was hard for the boy to see him go, but he said, I'll, I'll come back. Well, for somebody like this boy who had already lost both of his parents, this was a tough thing now to see John go. And he was full of grief. Then the bishop said to the boy, I'm actually really busy, but there's this other presbyter, this priest. He's actually going to look after you. How do you think somebody with, let's just say, a preoccupied, angry attachment would respond to that? He got angry. In this case, Eusebius said, he got wildly angry. And he went off 
into the mountains outside the city, and he gathered around him some of the most violent young adult men that lived in and outside the town, and he became the gang lord for that town. And they would rob and kill travelers coming in and out of the city. They would, uh, you know, they would revel with uh, drinking and out of control behavior. And he really became the, the head of the gang outside that city. So after about two years, John returned to the city and he went right to the bishop and he said, where's, where's my spiritual son? And the bishop kind of hung his head. He said, um, I think he's up in the mountains. And Eusebius, or Eusebius says that John got it right away what that meant. And John really let the bishop have it. He said, I trusted him to you. You should have known what was going to happen if you passed him off to somebody else. And John left himself angry and started walking up the mountain. Now at this point, he's over 80 years old. So he's not a young man, but he goes up into the mountains. And the way Eusebius describes it is he, he got up past the foothills towards where the gang stayed and several members of the mountain gang came out and met him and said, what do you want, old man? He says, I want to see, in whatever language he would have used, I want to see the boss. And they all looked at him like, are you crazy? Why do you want to see him? He'll just, he'll kill you. And John said, no, either take me to him or bring him to me. And so they went and got the boy. And they said, there's this old guy out here. He's looking for you. He came out. And when he saw who it was, I want to ask again for predictions. What do you think he did? Felt bad, repented. Felt angry. Uh, big, hug, big hug and started crying. Big hug and started crying. Angry. He ran. He turned and he ran as fast as he could the other way. John and John ran after him and lasted, you know, maybe a couple hundred yards and then stopped and, and yelled out. He goes, if you keep running like that, I'm going to die because I can't catch you and that stopped the boy and then John came up the boy was on his knees on the ground and John whispered in his ear this is not your fault this is my fault I never should have left you and who said he cried and repented and that started a period of several months where John stayed and they prayed together. They took long walks together. He talked endlessly with the boy. And slowly, slowly over a couple months, the boy's anger subsided and he brought him back into the town and John saved him. This is a story about attachment. And what it helps us understand is that the church has been in the business of providing relational security to those of us who have broken or distorted or shattered attachment lives attachment experiences and that the ingredients that John used were loving presence hymns they sang together 
physical exercise, walking together vigorously, nature, being up in the mountains, and conversation. So prayer, hymns, exercise, the beauty of nature, conversation, close connection. Are, are these six things available in Peabody, Massachusetts? Yes. Yes, they are. If we, if we look, these, these things are available anywhere. You don't have to be a stinking shrink no. to repair attachment. The church has known this for thousands of years. Close connection, prayer, music, worship, physical movement and exercise, the beauty of nature, and conversation. These are the ways that a human says to another human, you matter, I know you, I love you, you're safe with me. You're free to become who, you would, who it is you are meant to become. I'm not going to tell you who to become. You look in your heart because you know you belong to me and I belong to you. The church has held, Mother Church has held us in this way or at least has offered this to us from the beginning. It's how it's supposed to be. I, on, honest to God, you know, ask me in 10 years, maybe I changed my mind, but I don't think so. It took me 53 to get here. We're made to love and be loved. And from there, then we find out what, what else we're made for. Then we find out what else God has put in us and around us to figure out who and what to become. So, next time you walk in to the sanctuary at St. Basilios, when you walk in to the sanctuary, if you're towards the back, what's the most prominent thing that you see? If you look straight ahead. Okay, and above the altar? Is there an icon? Yes. What is it? Platitera. And somebody describe the platitera. The mother of God, what's she doing? <coughs> Sitting in a throne welcoming. Is anybody with her? Yeah, us. Christ. As an infant. In Christ. Christ as an infant? What? <laughs> so are you telling me that <coughs> church architects thought the first thing people should see when they walk into an Orthodox sanctuary is a mother providing relational security to her infant son and saying, come on in. I don't think that's a coincidence. You could pick anything and put it up there. But what, what the church has decided makes the most sense is an image of the mother of God. And there's, there's way more theological meaning to this than I'm, I'm talking as, a, as, you know, a shrink who likes attachment theory. You get a theologian up here, I'm sure they got 92 other things that this means. But for me, I walk in there, it's a mother safely holding an infant saying, it's safe to come in. It's safe enough for me and my son, and we want you to come in and be safe too. So re remember, two things, right? Relational security and exploration. So there you go. The first icon is relational security. As you walk in, you get about halfway through and you look up. What's there? Pandocrator, Jesus, all sovereign. Which, if that was the first thing we had to encounter, walking into the church, I think it would be set in a, sending a little different message. It'd be a little, it's because it's kind of a severe icon. It's, it's an intense icon. And it's an icon, I think, that once we feel relationally secure enough to enter deeper into the sanctuary, then we start to explore the mystery of what the All-Sovereign is offering us in terms of love 
and is asking of us to love others. So relational security, Platitera invites us in. All sovereign says, and now let's get to work. Thank you. Yes. So, in the example with children and parents in a room with strangers, etc., let's take that example into a different level, where I go to the church to relate to my parent, who is the Lord. I'm trying, the child can see the parent, can go talk and hear, have conversation, get answer, respond, ask, get hugged, and that child can feel all that on, on the physical skin, mm -hmm. the physical body with the brain and eye, with the, the whole human. Now, me going into the church, I am trying to have a conversation, and yet <coughs> the other party is on the seventh heaven, and I do not get the answer, response, the how, right away at that time, at that moment, what would, how would we deal with our anger at that moment? Because we are not getting that um, same hug that our parents would do. Mm -hmm. What would be your advice? Well, besides the prayers that we are aware of and the six things that you listed, any, any other ways to deal with such situations, to, to feel the presence, to feel the love of the parents? Mm -hmm. God, that is, a, that is a great question. I would say you, you do lean, it, lean into the six ways that I, that I uh, suggested. Um, but I think, you know, the, one of the thoughts that I had as you were describing that scenario is that the kind of connection that we seek with God deep within us or with God all around us, when it's not skin to skin, that is an exploration that takes time and discipline and a lot of personal and familial and communal support in order to cool the inevitable anger that comes from a disconnection with our Creator. And there are also plenty of things going on in the world that serve to disconnect us from our Creator. So it, it, it becomes, it's not something one person can, can possibly manage on their own. If we're made to love and be loved, I think the church would, would always say that we have to find a way to explore within ourselves in, in quiet prayer. We have to find a way to explore around ourselves in the world. And the church is, is meant with its, with its six things or 78 things actually to try and keep us on that path. But it's a path of falling off and getting back on, falling off and getting back on. <coughs> And there's no question that, that God himself became human, I think this is solid scripturally, in order to communicate to us very clearly, I understand what it is to feel like you lose me. Because I lost my father on the cross. At least it felt like I did. So even in those places of anger, I think the message from God incarnate is, even in those darkest places, I know, I know what that is like and I'm there with you. My question would be, it's my understanding that when a child, the first five years of a child is that personality is formed. So as parents, you know, some parents, there's a lot of young people in this room, but even as I see adults, some of us are re religious educators in the system, and we see some of the kids as they go in the system, and you can see the different personalities, those that are, you know, what, what do you do in the family now? I think the relationship, you know, if the church's role then is, like, first of all, from an infant's point, I see my little granddaughter now who's eight months, and, you know, I see that, you know, the way she's opened up and so on, and they're bringing her around. 
Um, I guess my, my, what do you do as parents so that you can, in this world that's so fallen, to encourage a child so that they can grow and give them the roots they need, but the wings that eventually they'll need to soar with? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, even as adults, even when you have adult children, you know, we as parents sometimes, I speak for myself, but sometimes you want to say, you know, you don't want to cling to your kids, but you, but society almost tells you if you're not like, involved in their life are you detaching too much or, or you know where do you stand today in today's world because the message has been so it, it's just so confusing out there you know i mean just a healthy relationship that's that's mm -hmm. my question from infant to adult right what is, how is the health so uh a couple things one is uh current cognitive neuroscience says that the brain develops in two ways. It develops more stable structures that don't change that much over time. And so those first five years of life are very important because there's a kind of stability that's getting built up over that time. And what's called neuroplasticity which has been discovered much more recently, and that is that the brain always, until death, has the capacity to shift and form and change in both healthier and unhealthier ways. So I think that's really good news in that, yes, the, the early life of a child and their caretaking experience is hugely important, but it's not, it's not the end of the story that healthy attachment can take hold anywhere along the, the lifespan. Now, uh, uh, I, your question's a big one, but let me, let me just say this. In my opinion, what we can do for our children, starting from the time they're 40 days old, is bring them into a place of sacrament and worship and just not have it be a big deal. Make it part of the rhythm of their life. And treat them like kids when they're there. You know, kids are gonna squawk, kids are gonna cry, kids are gonna get up and walk, you know, up the solea, kids are gonna do stuff. Keep it, and I'm not saying let, let you know, kids run wild in church, but keep them in the sanctuary, worshiping, receiving the sacraments, and just have it be part of everyday life, number one. Number two, if there's a good camp program, and we have a good camp program here, get them going to that. Because that's got all the ingredients at the same time in one place with other kids. And there's something so powerful about it. I, I sincerely believe one of the greatest hopes for kids in this archdiocese is to get them to camp and get them to camp regularly because it contains all those ingredients and it gives them, gives them wings, you know? I, I, I think a secure kid is gonna wanna explore and then do it on their terms and that's one place where that can happen more. I can quote the research that, that kids whose, whose attachment history tended to be more full of trauma or, or abuse or or traumatic loss have a harder time exploring and, and tend to, to have a more difficult time with one thing in particular, but it's a thing that affects a lot of things, and that's regulating mood. Re being able to calm themselves down or seek out sources of calming. Therefore, need more structure and more support to do the exploring that they need to do. It, it, it becomes just a different increment of growth for kids that have had a really hard time from an attachment perspective early on. It, and it's not that they can't grow. Their brains are still made to grow. Neuroplasticity is, is the good news. But it requires some discernment and attunement and wisdom around their particular life and situation to give them that additional structure and support to move along in smaller increments.
I have a question uh, after this last person asked. How long will it take time for the children to explore, to do exploration, even if they don't have too much time, like one parent has a you know, different opinion, another parent um, want to go to worship and to child to explore? How long will it take that? How, how many years? Do we have idea? Do we have experience? Because I'm going to well, first of all, every, every kid is different. Some kids come into the world sturdy and ready to, to attach and ready to attach and ready to explore. And it's just a matter of not getting in their way. You know, others of us came into the world a little skittish, a little anxious, no matter how good our attachment uh, situation was. And so we gotta, we gotta, you know, we've gotta find ways to feel relationally secure enough to not let fear get in the way of exploration. So you, it depends on the kid. It depends on the situation. You gotta, and each one's different. And we as parents need to know a little bit about our own attachment style to try to account for it not getting too much in the way of our children. If I, if I'm an anxious parent and I have kids who are ready to explore, I don't want to put on them too much of that anxiety. But I still got to be, you know, I still got to be thoughtful and discerning about parenting. But it's a, it's a way of, you know, it's, it's the church's, part of the wisdom, I think, of the church is that it turns us inward. St. John Chrysostom said, when you discover the door to your heart, you discover the kingdom of heaven. And that journey to the door of our heart can be a messy one. Now, I'm not going to say that. It will be a messy one. But it's still a journey the church wants us to take. Because ultimately, that's where, that's where God lives in us, in our deepest heart. We believe that the kids are disconnected from the church, which means that the parents can try their hard to create the security or secure attachments in their homes or whatever, um, but the parents are also in a different dynamic now, working so many hours, and kids are not in a very good situation. What can the church do to reconnect the kids, or create that impulse, or the message, send out the message that it is safe to be in the church, to create, uh, to create that attachment back to the church, so that uh, they're not looking for their attachments in their cell phones or in their, um, I don't know where they look for it. Mm -hmm. Well, the friends are, I think, fine, but if, if they if they're atta detached from the church, which provides the most healthy, secure attachment, as John, um, the evangelist story tells us, and the kids are disconnected from the church, and the parents don't have time for them, so where do they find it and where are they? Mm -hmm. It's a big question. I'm sorry. Yeah. So uh, this, this flies under the banner of easier said than done. should be right here. <laughs> but the way I understand that is one of the central events in the history of the world and the history of humanity and the history, certainly the history of the church, is that God, through the Virgin Mary became human and was born as a child in order to meet human beings where they were rather than wait for them to somehow get to where God was at some distant place. So the easier said than done approach would be we have to meet kids the church has to meet kids where they are. The church has to become incarnate into the complicated, messy lives of our children in a way that they experience the attunement of people who aren't trying to overpower them or change them too quickly or keep them from being children. And to do this, it takes a lot of energy and time and resources and people and love and wisdom and patience. That's why it's easier said than done because most of our communities are full of busy parents and overworked priests and 
th there's no way there's no way in the way our parishes are set up that clergy can keep all the children somehow active and connected to church. So whatever it is that's going on in that church, and I think the basics, the basics always are, are worship, fellowship, and finding a way to let kids or adults give something back that's coming from the best of them. Those are the basics. Worship, fellowship, give something back. That brings anybody to life if you can put those things together. But in order to do that, there have to be a lot of good examples around, and it takes time. All right, thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. This was a wonderful Thank you. Thank you.